what, what, I, what I'm hearing is, is advocacy for a system uh, where um, one sheep and four wolves vote to see what's for dinner. Uh, no, yes. not quite. And, and, like and, you, because, you, because it's not one sheep and four wolves. It's every single creature in the forest voting for whomever they choose to represent themselves. Well, that's kumbaya. That's, that's wonderful. Um, but I believe that individuals have certain rights that oh, when, when you say that because we gang together and we now have the ability to steal something from somebody else, that really concerns me. No, it's if, not stealing. And like you said, so it's a in other words, the difference, the difference between the, the difference between doing it legally and illegally. If I stole Jeff Bezos's money, I would be a thief. But if we all vote on it and take his money and give it to everybody, that's or if you're not a that. Private equity firm, and you go. Welcome. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute, and your devil's advocate. He is an ideological opponent of mine. But I just found out we own the same make of ukulele. Ian Silveri from Progress Now. Now, you have a Fender ukulele. Yes, sir. Uh, notice the, the Fender beginning, the, 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 the classic Fender head on there, which is, which is one of a kind. But you have what's known as a soprano ukulele. Yes, sir. It's, it's higher. It's an octave higher. I think it's, a, is it an octave higher? I believe so. And mine is a tenor ukulele, which is an octave lower. But all that really means is to say, mine is bigger. No come back to that? Damn it. All right. We'll get to it. All right. All right. We'll, have to. We'll, 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 we'll jam out later. Um, Sounds good. First of all, Star Wars or Star Trek? I'm concerned about your... Star Wars. Why? Um, as a kid, I uh, I got I had the privilege of seeing A New Hope and Empire and Jedi, and I just fell in love with the story. I fell in love with the good versus evil, the rebels versus the empire. Um, I was a big punk rock fan back in the day. I still am, actually. And that all kind of like meshes with the worldview that I uh, developed and why I got into politics to begin with. Um, fighting against the big the big machine, I, I came up uh, sort of, you know, I was born in 85, so, you know, Reagan and Clinton were my first presidents. But when I started paying attention in the world, it was George W. Bush. And as a, as a, a son of a man who was um, contemporaries and classmates with Al Sharpton at Tilden High School in Brooklyn, New York City, um, I was raised by liberal parents. And just those kinds of stories about the little guy versus the big guy, which is fun because I know conservatives fashion themselves in much the same way. Um, was really attractive to me. And I actually didn't watch Star Trek until I was in high school. So I just never developed the same kind of like nostalgic uh, connection. So, but you were born after Star Wars, what's now called episode that four. Is true. So that is true. You, so you weren't there when it actually happened. So no. You, so uh, Star Wars sucks for a whole bunch of reasons. Oh, God, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, Our one, first disagreement. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I grew up probably in the shadow of the original Star Trek, the same way you grew up in the shadow of Star Wars. And for people my age, um, 55, it's one of the few cultural things that we all kind of shared, you know? So yeah. everybody gets, he's dead, Jim. Although today, people don't get, be me up, Scott. I get he's dead, Jim. Yeah, but that's because you're, you're still a geek. If you're a Star Wars person, yeah, you, st you have to be fluent. You have to be uh, <laughs> fluent. You have to be uh, bilingual in, in these things. Um, Indeed. What I hated about Star Wars was the reinventionism, uh, the redoing of history, the going back and changing things to make them politically correct. Um, Han shot first, uh, first and foremost. <laughs> um, and, and so oh, to cool. go back to our competing worldviews, uh, I don't believe in revisionist history. Uh, sure. Star Wars does, and to have the uh, guys at Star Wars going back, and they put Jabba and Jabba the Hutt into the first episode, what's called the fourth episode. When, when I was a kid, we had to wait and to see what what the monster looked like, and so it was I a know. suspenseful thing. So basically, it is the revisionism of progressivism that draws people to 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 your world. Um, do you do you um, identify with the rebels? Or the Empire? The Rebels, of course. I mean, I'm wearing the, wearing the symbol for the day. And, and obviously, 
you know, ever since 2016, the, the Rebel Alliance and, and its symbology has become a bit of a rally for our side against uh, Trump and his administration. Really? Sure, yeah. You see these all it. the time. What so do you, you mean? So when I, see, when I see the rebel sign, I'm supposed to think that's an anti-Trump thing? You can. It's a way of interpreting it if you'd like to. At the moment, I'm just wearing it because it was like the, what, you know, one of the clean t-shirts, and I thought, John will appreciate this Star Wars thing, and then we can hopefully have this conversation. So I'm glad it worked. Let's jump into a column you did for The Post uh, promoting a progressive tax increase here in Denver. Uh, sure. There are folks uh, who are trying to get that on the ballot. We'll see if it makes it. If it does, yeah. it would be a $2 billion a year tax increase, um, mostly coming from people in higher income brackets. Um, That's correct. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a big goal for your team. It's a big uh, thing that we will fight on our team. What do you love about it? A lot of stuff. So thanks for the opportunity, first of all, to be on the show. It's a lot of fun. And I, I dig the new set. The angles are good. Uh, everything looks great. Um, the angles are good. The angles are good. You know what I care about? I care about fairness and I care about, you know, everybody having the sort of same opportunity to succeed as everybody else has. So when you talk about a progressive income tax, what, you know, this this thing on the ballot is, you know, it's actually a tax cut for 95 percent of Coloradans, not unlike the initiative you're uh, behind, Initiative 306, which lowers the rate um, to 4.55. This lowers the rate to 4.6, so it's a little bit higher than yours, but still lower than the uh, the current rate for everybody making $250,000 a year or less. And if you if you make $250,000 a year, um, up to 500,000, the rate then goes to 7%. If you make half a million dollars to a million, the rate goes to 7.75%. And if you're uh, super successful, super lucky, you're both, you make a million bucks or more, the rate goes up to 8.9%. So it's a graduated income tax, a progressive income tax. And it, it's how 36 other states in the country do their income taxation. We used to do that here in Colorado. Uh, the Independence sure. Institute was uh, involved in bringing it to a flat rate. You use the term fair. Um, I do. And, and fair is one of these, these magical terms that, like an ink blot, seems to, seems to uh, uh, change depending on who's using the word. The idea that, that we all pay the same amount, the same percentage of tax, seems remarkably fair to me. Sure, uh, on the surface. It, uh, well, not only on the surface, but throughout the whole thing. That what I make, I pay. What you make, you pay. What, what is unfair about a flat rate income tax? So it's interesting that you should say that because it's because intuitively it seems that way, right? Intuitively, it seems like, OK, we all get taxed at the same rate, which means that the same exact percentage of my income goes to taxes as somebody wealthier than me or somebody less wealthy than me. And, and intuitively, I think that makes sense. But what's interesting is what happens when you start adjusting those rates, right? So, for instance, you're uh, 306, which brings it to 4.55. What happens when you lower flat taxes is that it actually disproportionately benefits people who are wealthier and does very, very little for people with lower incomes. For instance, if you make $75,000 a year, which is roughly the state average for a family poor in Colorado, or at least was before you know the whole coronavirus thing, um, you'd get about 60 bucks a year, or rather you wouldn't pay an additional 60 bucks a year under your measure if it passes. However, if you make half a million dollars a year, that's more like 400 bucks. And while that's like a relativity thing, we can all probably agree that someone who makes half a million dollars, $400 to them is eh, not so much. And 60 bucks, let's face it, not even going to get you a year in Netflix anymore and certainly is probably not going to do I've a always, ton for I've always you. found that argument really insulting. Oh, and I'm sorry. And the idea that, that 60 bucks, eh, it just isn't much for somebody. Um, for a working family, 60 bucks is still 60 bucks. That's, Don't get me wrong. That's, I don't disagree that's, that's that. That's clothes for the kids. That's meals. Sure, that's a sure. night out. Uh, it, but, it, is, it is something. Well, but but well, furthermore, effect... if, if the idea is to help people at the lower end of the in, income spectrum, then certainly you'd want a much lower tax for, for them. Uh, this progressive income tax increase doesn't do that as much as, sure does. Uh, as much as, wait for the rest of the sentence, as much as uh, my income tax cut because it cuts it even a little bit more. And mind you, it's a 0.03% difference. So yeah. you're, you're correct. That is, but again, like that's very, very, very minuscule when you start talking about real dollars. And what I, what I wanted to continue to say, and I appreciate it, is not just that I don't look, everybody, like, if you found 60 bucks on the ground, you'd go spend it on something good, right? Especially if you were lower income, that could be food, that could be clothes. You're not wrong about that. 
My point is that what it adds up to is $150 million in lost revenue for the state that is currently facing a $3.3 billion revenue shortfall because of the economic conditions caused by the coronavirus. So 60 bucks for somebody at one time once a year might be like, okay, cool, this is like 60 bucks I didn't have yesterday, that's better than nothing. But when your classroom size gets increased, when your roads aren't fixed, I know we're, we share values on transportation funding, when your teachers are getting paid the lowest in the entire country, especially Which adjusted for cost of complete, living. Complete fib there, but let, let me, let's go back. What do you back. mean? Oh, we are in the middle of, of, of the pack for, for education spending. And if dollar we want, for dollar, but not in terms of cost of living for teachers. All right. Let's go, let's go back because we'll split her out into too many topics real fast. So let, let okay. me do this. Yeah, that's true. You said you know, this is $150 million lost to the state. Even that mindset is so different than mine. That I said lost it was revenue. A, lost revenue to, to the state. What you're saying is lost revenue to the state government. No, no, it wasn't the state government's revenue to begin with. No, I, I understand They didn't that lose argument. it. Now, I don't know if you do, because this is $150 <laughs> million dollars that I want to keep in private hands where, right. where rich people and poor people are using it to energize an economic uh, recovery to get ah, it going. That, that see, what we want, what I want, and, and, and let me get it out and then, okay. then tell me I'm wrong. Please. The, that <laughs> what I want is for there to be less money that is just assumed that it has to be the state. You know, the state has been awash in money um, uh, for year after year after year. The Trump tax code was another huge windfall for the state um, because, of, uh, because we didn't lower our income tax rate to match what the, what the feds did. You know, so I trust those dollars in the hands of human beings uh, more so than government bureaucrats. That oh, uh, government bureaucrats this. are human beings too. But uh, let's let's just but let's they're not just motivated so, by the same thing. Well, I, I, I don't disagree. I don't agree. I think people have plenty of different motivations. But let's let's look at what happens when we actually have a situation like the one that you're talking about, that the one that's preferable for you. Um, our neighbors to the east, Kansas, tried this a little while ago, didn't they? Governor Sam Brownback, back in 2011 and 12, pushed through a raft of gigantic tax cuts that benefited corporations and the wealthy and people up and down. They had a progressive tax structure. Then he locked off the top rate and then created a bunch of exemptions for pass-throughs and stuff. The revenue for the state of Kansas plummeted, which did a couple of things. First, their school budgets had tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in deficits that were no longer uh, able to fill. So they had to cut schools. They had to cut teachers. They had to reduce school days to four day weeks. We know quite a bit about that in Colorado, unfortunately. It scared businesses out of the state of Kansas by the droves, which is really interesting because normally you would think that, oh, tax cuts, like lower tax rates, that's what attracts businesses. Not in this case at all. And it was so catastrophic that Republican supermajorities in both chambers of the Kansas legislature overrode a veto that Brownback put forward when they tried to reverse his cuts and they were eventually successful in doing so. Republicans brought $1.2 billion a year in tax hikes back on the books after that failed experiment that happened. You also so mentioned, we know what happened. You mentioned a detail there about um, uh, special tax cuts. And I think you and I could find some common ground on, yes. on this part, Agreed. which is uh, a lot of people confuse business with cronyism, and yeah. um, and both sides of the aisle are very big into cronyism, and it's hidden in all sorts of things, whether it's a tax uh, credit for um, the producers of bull semen over here, or it's a tax right. credit for the producers of Teslas over there. There, right. you know, there, there's something wrong going on here uh, when when this cronyism happens, and so cronyism really hurts those. Um, uh, those incentives. You know, I'll take a look at high tax states like Illinois, where the productive people are fleeing, fleeing to states that have lower taxes. I see it in New York. We're seeing it in California. One of the reasons I think Cal Colorado is turning more progressive is we're getting a whole bunch of Californian refugees who, who like the skiing <laughs> and, and the lower taxes. But we, we are in a competitive world where we have a neighbor to the north that has no income tax. You see that populations are going to Texas and to Florida, uh, where there's where there are no income taxes. Um, you know, we we live in a place where I want to attract businesses and employers, and 
I don't find it offensive if somebody makes more than I do that they get to keep a, the same percentage more of what they earn. I, I find so, that to be fair. It's not an unreasonable position. It really isn't. I'm glad we're having this conversation because you and I do agree that there has been an unbelievable amount of carve outs and special interests getting treated differently in tax codes on the federal level, on the state level, on the city level and everywhere in between. I find that deplorable as I know you do too. Um, what bothers me the most is that, you know, when you have, you have two things going on here, you have a, a concentration of wealth at the very top in this country that's unlike anything we've ever seen. If it worked the way I think you want it to, which is that that money gets reinvested, that money starts businesses, that money gets put into companies, that money allows entrepreneurs to start new businesses, which creates even more wealth. If it really worked that way, then I'd probably agree with you a little bit more. But the problem is that's actually not what happens. The wealth gets hoarded by a very, very small number of people, concentrated at the top, while the rest of us are sort of like sitting around here waiting for the table scrap to drop and say, oh, good, look, I, a little bit trickled down. I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't buy the, 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 the victim mythology that, that has built that lore. I will agree, um, in the last uh, decade, there has been really slow income growth for people at the lower end of the, the economic right ladder. On. And it's one of those things that um, um, you and I will see different causes of it. I see sure. the bureaucratic causes of uh, too much regulation, too much taxation, that it's hard for people to actually compete with these big guys because the big guys are now the ones making all the rules. I found it fascinating that under Trump, we actually started to see real income growth for people on the lower end of, of the spectrum at a faster rate than those at the higher end. Um, uh, just just in time for Corona to, 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 to start there changing that. But Th that that is a mythology killer if in fact people on the lower income level are starting to get more money as they were before corona hit uh, but there's also there's also an ethical part here for me which is you you look at the people who hoard the money at the top and darn those evil billionaires they must be awful people but it is a fluid situation People who are poor in America are mobile more so than most any p country in history and still pretty much any place around the world, I think there's some exceptions, to be able to come in and build something that they own that's theirs. And we also forget the other side of the equation of rich people who do not keep their money because they cannot keep up with, um, um, uh, with competition. The statistic that hit me, and, and I cannot verify this, so somebody do it for me, was something like one out of, or eight out of 10 first generation millionaires in the United States were immigrants. Yeah, I find that to be amazing. That's great. That's well, well, what it shows is that people come here, they don't know the language, they don't know the customs, they don't know the law, they, they, but still within a generation can build up that wealth. Yeah, I know my, very my few places, I find very a, few places that have that type of economic mobility and to have that economic mobility, we need to have a system that doesn't regulate these poor little guys to death. So no I time. don't disagree. I, I think that smaller businesses, entrepreneurs, we should take a really hard look at when people take a risk and people want to start a business, what you can do to make sure that they don't get sort of like priced out by competition or taxes or anything on the front end. Right? I, don't mind like, I, I, taxed, I don't mind them getting competitioned out. That's, well, that's you're the way saying it works. that when you rig the game at the top, that's what we're talking about here, right? When you're the big guys and you rig the game at the top so that the little guys can't even get off the ground. I, I, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, but my grandfather's a, a great example of what you're talking about. He, he's a Holocaust survivor. He came here after the war and he opened the splendid meat market and butcher shop in uh, Brooklyn, New York City, which was, you know, first generation American, did not speak any English. Like I said, a refugee from concentration camps, married my grandmother in Sweden and then moved here. Um, and was fortunate enough to be able to immigrate here um, through the system at the time, which was accepting lots of folks from Eastern Europe. And he was born in Poland. He was in the Lodge ghetto before he was um, shipped off to two concentration camps and, and was liberated through Auschwitz. Um, and then that's the only, that's the reason why I get to do what I do today, because two generations ago, my grandfather was a, you know, poor uh, uh, cattle rancher in, um, in Ludge, Poland. And then now I... I'm here in, in beautiful Lakewood, Colorado, and we have our five-month-old baby, and I have a job that I love, and my wife has a job that she loves, and that's all because of the opportunities that he was given. But he was a huge Democrat, and he was an unbelievable supporter of paying back into the system so that you could get back what 
um, the next generation could be able to, to, to succeed. Like I went to public school in New Jersey. I went to a public K-12 and then I went to Rutgers University, which is a school that sort of gets better the further away from it you are. And out here, like, you know, oh, Rutgers, good school. Yeah, it's, 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 it's decent. And, and my education costs I'm, I'm missing, me. I'm missing my, your, I'm missing your point. My point is that we need to, in, when we invest in things together, like public schools, when, like public universities, like making sure that you're not being crushed under a mountain of debt when you go to college, that costs money. And I don't think it should be the lower income people who pay for it. I think if you've done incredibly well in this country, you should have to give back to the structures and systems that gave you the opportunity to get as wealthy as you did, to do as well First as you all, did, so I, that everybody I, I else love, can I love the thing. terms like invest, you know. Shouldn't shouldn't we contribute? You more don't to, think schools are an investment? You don't I, think, I the, think the public education? Is I think an investment an investment, investment is something individuals do. Expenditures are something that the state does. If this is a good state expenditure, we'll get it. But the the point being that when these these people who have made it, they don't keep their money by oh, they keep hoarding quite it. A bit of it. <laughs> oh, hang on, they don't they keep, keep the money by it. hoarding their money. They keep their money by producing, by giving us something we want. Yeah, Bill Gates might be a weird, awful guy, but what he was able to bring to market has revolutionized the world. I, you, you don't remember the world before uh, cheap computing. I do. Barely, Let me tell yeah. you, it, it, he has done more for the standard of living of every person uh, around the globe than Mother Teresa ever did. Uh, sure, and he advocates for higher tax rates for the wealthy. Uh, good himself. for him, but right, but, and he can give more money. But the point being, <laughs> if Microsoft but you can't just give more when, money, well, but what you want to do is take more money. He can give more money, which, by the way, he and his wife are doing by an incredible yes. amount. An incredible uh, amount. But he has to keep inventing. He has to keep producing good products. Uh, and you know what? In 10 years, Microsoft might have given away to Google, which might give away to something else, which might give away to something else. Right. And those things provide us services. And if someone becomes masterfully wealthy by giving us a product or service I like, more power to them. I, I, don't, I don't hold these guys up as bad guys or evil guys that need to be punished. I hold these guys up as, I want to be like them. I want other people yeah. to have those opportunities. So I, think I don't want to pun I don't want to dissuade any of their stuff and I don't want them to move to Texas where they pay less in taxes. I'd it rather they seem stay like here. They've been dissuaded though. Uh, so so let's take another example like Jeff Bezos, right? Uh, a friend of mine pointed this out to me recently and I just thought this was like very telling. So if 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 you worked every single day, right? Saturdays and Sundays included. And you took home five thousand dollars a day from the time Columbus sailed to America to the time that we're you having wouldn't this get as much as right him. now. Who cares? No, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't even be a billionaire. It's not even a matter of Who cares? how much. Who You'd have you'd have nine hundred some odd million dollars. So Why what? Why isn't that enough? Why isn't that enough? Why? Who who are you to decide what's enough for another? We're deciding human right being? here. We're having this conversation. No, Why no, no. See, see the difference. The difference, the difference in ideology, I think, is that I tolerate other people having what they w wish to have and what they've earned. I feel no empowerment uh, to take what someone else has earned, that that's theirs, and they can do with it what they wish. Now, we do have taxes. We do have minimal government requirements. Uh, Article 1, Section of 8 of the Constitution pretty much spells out what, what the feds have power to do. They've expanded Correct. long beyond that. I believe Land beyond line. beyond um, uh, basic safety and judges and roads, there the limits of government are are pretty clear. So here's the thing that might surprise you. I actually don't necessarily think that government is the very best at putting programs in place regularly. I think sometimes they are. I think that what we've seen in terms of like response to the opioid epidemic has been really interesting and really encouraging. That you have a pretty big investment finally coming in from government to nonprofits, to medical providers, to um, organizations that work hard on trying to curb substance use disorder. And you've seen a lot of success. The death curve from that stuff was actually unbelievable even before COVID. And it's getting worse now as a result of the coronavirus as well. But, you know, I think that there are there are 
parts where government doesn't do a very, very good job of actually implementing programs. What I do think government is actually good at, and this is going to drive you nuts, is, is the distribution and redistribution of resources. And I think that it should be the case and should be the ability for us together to decide because we live in a representative society, representative form of government. We elect people to go to the legislature. In Colorado, we don't allow them to increase taxes on anybody. We have TABOR, which I know you love so much. Um, but I do think that it should be the ability well, so what, and responsibility. What, 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 what I'm hearing is, is advocacy for a system uh, where um, one sheep and four wolves vote to see what's for dinner. Uh, no, yes. not quite. And, and, like and, you, because you because it's not one sheep and four wolves. It's every single creature in the forest voting for whomever they choose to represent themselves. Well, that's kumbaya. That's that's wonderful. Um, but I believe that individuals have certain rights that. Oh, when, when you say that because we gang together, and uh, we now have the ability to steal something from somebody else, that really concerns me. No, it's if, not stealing, and like you said, so it's a in other words, the difference, the difference between the, the difference between doing it legally and illegally. If I stole Jeff Bezos's money, I would be a thief. But if we all vote on it and take his money and give it to everybody. That's or if you're not a that. private equity firm and you go and suck the value out of a company, that's not that either, right? Do you own the, the, the firm? Do you buy the stock? Does that equity firm own How did that they stock? get the money to begin with? I mean, this is the thing. There are structural inequities that are <laughs> wait, built. Wait, 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 wait. Let's go, let's go back to my, my question. So uh, the difference between theft and good policy is that more people agree that we should take Jeff Bezos' no, money. No, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go down the taxation is theft line because you just said it yourself that this is a constitutional power that our founders and framers all agreed upon, and that we continue to vote For on in Colorado. For limited purposes, limited purposes of a natural national defense of post yep. offices of yep. roads. Oh, I love post offices. I'm glad you said that. Um, not uh, of, of public not, schools. Uh, in the Colorado Constitution, yes, not in the national yeah. Constitution. So, but right, uh, I don't see anywhere here. where it said health care. I don't see where it said midnight basketball. I didn't see all sorts of things. I don't know, about, and, I don't know anything about midnight basketball, but I think health care is actually an interesting question, and we should we should have that conversation because let's let's finish let's talk, finish the ideological conversation. Um, yes, I do believe taxation is theft when it's above the rate of of the basic uh, functions of government, and just because it's done by a group doesn't make it any more moral, doesn't make it any more ethical. Um, I but find the, it, I find it like more Tabor, intolerant. But you like Tabor, which allows the group, the collective, the mm -hmm. majority, to decide whether or not they want to increase taxes. Isn't and that counter to what you just said? No, because what Tabor does is uh, it allows the people who are being taken from to have a say. If left to, and this is what we had before Tabor, what we had was increasing government uh, takings, increasing government takings, increasing government takings. You were, you were young, so you don't recall, but government was <laughs> growing here in Colorado. No, quite, I don't, I don't mean that as an insult. But in the late 1980s, Colorado's government was growing at an incredible rate uh, to the point that there was backlash because the people, the 100 people in that uh, building down the street from us, were more co easily controlled than uh, the taxpayers who are being who are being taken from. So to limit that amount and say no, if you want to have more, you have to ask the people from whom you're taking it. That's different than saying, hey, let's all get together and just jump on Bezos. That's why I find well, sure. a progressive income tax an unethical income tax. But here's but here's the question. So so uh, as you probably believe, I I, I won't put words in mouth. Do you think? that the language in Tabor that says shall taxes be increased by a big scary number is like a, is a very big disincentive toward um, increasing taxes. Like just that, that one what? module. What? Transparency is not a, a disincentive. Yeah. The amount See, is. Th this is the problem, right? It's not, it's not total transparency. It's, it's very one-sided. You're giving somebody a loaded statement when you do that. So for instance, if the fair tax were on the Wait. ballot and it said, well, just let me finish. If the fair tax were on the ballot and it said, shall taxes be increased by $2 billion per year, blah, blah, blah. Most people see that sticker shock and go, ah, and maybe they don't read the rest of it. But if it said, shall taxes be increased by this much on this income bracket, this much on this income bracket, and this much on this income bracket, do you think it would have a better chance of passing? I don't know. We're gonna find well, I think out. it would. But, but, and uh, I think quick, that's quick, real quick, transparency. Quick, quick, uh, did you call this the fair tax? Yeah. Your, your progressive income tax is the fair. What's interesting about that 
is that for years there's an organization called the Fair Tax um, Foundation who has been working towards eliminating all income tax on a federal level and replacing it with yeah, a consumption tax. So, you know, mind really you, really it goes back to the oh idea God. of fair. I, I find the progressive income tax completely unfair. And um, I find the flat income tax completely unfair and regressive as well. So we're just going to see that differently. But my point is, if you want true transparency on the ballot, you should tell people who's going to pay how much, not just what the total big scary number is, don't you think? No, we have it right there. Why? This is what it's going to cost. The budget is going to cost this. The amount is going to co cost this. And by the way, Tabor no. seems, it seems to have worked very, very well. Uh, most localities have completely debruced from, from Tabor. You know, I don't know what the problem of consent over taxation seems to be. It doesn't uh, bother me when you actually have the question being posited fairly. What, what bothers about, me is, what about the, is when you have the question being rigged in the direction of, of one outcome. What about the rigging of raising taxes without going to the people? I'm talking about things like the faster tax called a fee. Sure, but the you know what the provider Supreme Court said about to, that. Well, no, hang on a second. I, I want to get yeah. your opinion on this. Go ahead. Do, you, do you believe that people should be asked their consent before taxes are raised? Or do you believe that the people in office should have the power to do it without going I to I think that in 49 other states, I'm asking you, just, uh, just give me a straight answer. No, I, I, I think that we elect people to go to the All capital right. to make decisions for us both fiscally and policy-wise because not everybody has the level <laughs> and amount of time as you and I do to dig into all the stuff and get really nerdy about the so state in other words, policy. So in other words, they... We're a republic. Poor, a republican poor form stupid of people. elects people to go... Poor, to stupid go make voters. You know, so we they're should, not stupid if they have all the information. My point is that Tabor doesn't give them all the information. It gives them the information that it wants to give them in order to prevent this any might be kind another, of This might be whatsoever. another part of a difference in worldview. And let me use Maybe. my language and you'll use yours. I do not want to ever give up my power to some sort of elite. And that elite are the people either in that, that building or the elite that decide what insurance program I must have or I can't have or some other elite that tell me what light bulb I need to have. Um, and so when you say that those voters, you know, they just don't have the time like you and I have because we are political junkies, um, that's pretty damn insulting. I mean, it, I it's their so. money. I think that's the and, whole and, and, reason why the country was I don't, set up the way it I don't was. want that elite, whether it's a school board telling me what my kid has to learn or sure. the elite telling me what light bulb I have to use. But we're not a direct democracy. We're a Republican form of democracy. And we elect lots of people to lots of different boards and commissions and legislative bodies to make those decisions for us. That's the way the founders envisioned this country. And that's the way the state constitution was written and there, as there well. Are a lot of, there are a lot of conservatives who agree with you just on that way. I might be Thanks. different than those conservatives because I believe there needs to be a check and balance to those elites. Yeah, um, they're called elections and they happen They are really, elections, really but there regularly. needs to be something more, and that something more is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And, and, and that's again, why if, that the tax, we love if the Taxpayer Bill of Rights were more transparent and it said who was having their taxes raised, I would be way more into, into it than I am right now. In fact, Maybe we can work together, you and I, to make Tabor more transparent, to say not just shall taxes be increased by the big number, but also here are the people who are going to pay and here's by how much. Would you want to do that with us? I would love to do a list that also includes how much the real cost is per family, because what happens is sure. when, when a tax increase pops out for education, uh, the blue book says this is only going to cost a family of four, you know, four dollars, and then just like you started this, who needs sixty bucks? That's so little. But really, businesses don't pay taxes; people pay taxes. And I would love to see something in in Tabor that says this two billion dollar tax increase is going to be coming out of our population of five million. How much is that per individual, man, woman, and child? That's what this thing is going to cost. I think that's okay. I think we should actually talk about that. This is probably not the right place to kick that idea out, but I'm, I'm interested because if we're talking about transparency, I actually do trust the voters to be able to make the right decisions you, if they're given the full amount of information. Why don't you be more transparent and just repeal the Taxpayer Bill of Rights? You don't like it. Wouldn't that be a much more like, transparent thing to do? I don't like most do? of it. There are things about it that I do like. You know, there, there are things about it that I think are actually Would you like to repeal the Taxpayer Bill of Rights? If, I, if it was like a binary choice, that or, that or a poke in the eye, yeah, sure. 
That's not the choice. <laughs> the choice is what's the choice? The, yes or no? Get rid of Tabor as it is, or yes. keep it. If it were, so, if I had to get rid of it as it as it is, I would. But I but I do think, and I think you know this, that we can actually take parts of it and change parts of it, or or keep parts of it if we want to. Right? We have that ability. Well, well, we're going to find out this fall with uh, the progressive income. I hope taxes. so. How are you guys going to get your thing on the ballot? The same way you're going to get your thing on the ballot, we're going to ask people to sign signatures. Well, I just mean like COVID world. Like, uh, have you thought about like what you're going to have to do in order to get those signatures in? I think people want a tax cut, and um, I found it so disingenuous when the uh, when the Trump tax code came through that the state legislature, without a vote of the people, because of a Republican form of government, raised our taxes by keeping the tax level the same. If we were going to be tax neutral, we would have lowered our flat tax. And for those people who don't quite get the mechanics of this, uh, the Colorado state income tax, you're taxed on your federal taxable income. That amount actually went up under uh, the Trump code. And therefore, the state should have lowered their um, uh, uh, income tax rate so that the amount coming through would be the same. But they didn't do that. Well, so let's ask. They, they kept it. They kept it the same, which was a which was another tax increase without approval of the people. Can we agree on well, that part? No, actually, I don't think we can. And especially because there's one constitutional amendment that we're really ignoring here that I think is pretty important, which is Amendment 23. As you know, Amendment 23 says we have to increase spending on education by inflation plus population every single year up to 2011. And well, you don't need to tell me. I, I ran the failed that. campaign against that. You did. But why are we allowed to why are we allowed to ignore the effect of Amendment 23, i.e. we still owe our schools billions and billions of dollars in the thing that uh, politicians and budget writers call the negative factor that they apply why, to. Why oh, haven't. Let me finish. Let me finish. Uh, no, actually, quick question. Why haven't they sued on that? Which is which is ridiculous. If they the have. The Supreme Court decided that the negative factor was constitutional, which is a decision that I disagree with. I disagree with it as well. Yeah, so I think we should we owe our schools several billion dollars, and that's where that's you know if you're if you're the state legislature and you finally have the ability to invest a couple hundred million dollars in schools to try and buy down that negative factor, i.e., make good on some of the IOU that we have to our public schools in Colorado. Well, the, the, why wouldn't you? The solution is to get rid of that ridiculous mandate because a spending mandate Tabor is a is a mandate of how much money comes in gets limited, but when you put something on autopilot. You know, if there is a nuclear holocaust um, and, and there is no money coming in, Colorado right. is still supposed to spend the more money on, on education. But the voters decided that they should. All right, the which was a smart and all ridiculous. Powerful, aren't which was a ridiculous Wait decision. A second. <laughs> but you said you said you said just a little while ago that consent's all that matters, and that when we're asking people for stuff, they're smart okay. enough to know what they're voting on. So why are they dumb in this case? Because they made a mistake. <laughs> Did they not? I would argue that they made a mistake in passing Tabor, so I guess we'll just have to agree on those two things. But, the, the, but, but understand the difference in the outcome. No, I get the, what the you're mistake, saying. The mistake in Tabor, right? the mistake in Tabor has this safety valve, which is government can grow as much as you want. You, you can put your kids into as much debt as you want. All you have to do is ask for consent. I thought but you consent have to was ask matter. For, my point the difference. Is, let, we, me finish, let me finish the quick thought. Right? The okay. difference with Amendment 23 was it took away consent and said, it doesn't matter. Uh, you have to, you legislators have to do the same. If I was smarter, I would have gone in there and put in a, an Amendment 23, but had that money put towards roads instead of education. Oh, man, we would have, we would have like platinum roads from every, every uh, schoolhouse yeah. to the Independence Institute and right here to Lakewood. It would, it would be beautiful. But, but my be point beautiful. is we did ask for consent, and the voters knew what they were voting on on Amendment 23, and they said, yes, yes, we would like every single year education spending to increase. And what has the state legislature done? Not that. Every single year since the passage of Amendment 20, we haven't honored that promise once. And therefore, your solution was to have a tax increase Without a uh, uh, an election for, uh, I think that, for, well, for, we, for the faster fees for the, the hospital provider fee for both growth dividend the middle freeze, freeze and now the uh, and now the governor and now the president's uh, tax cut which is a tax increase in Colorado another tax so I keep seeing a whole bunch of taxes happening without a vote of the people that also bothers the hell out of me. And that's so, also something that the state Supreme Court says, 
right. is legal. As you know, as you know that you're allowed to raise fees, you're allowed to have cash funds, you're no, allowed to we're have not allowed to raise fees. Payments. The elite are allowed to raise fees without well, why don't raising. You run, man? So let me let me ask you this: There will be another thing on the ballot with a little bit of luck that says, when there's a large fee going on uh, uh, through the legislature, that we the people have to okay that fee, so they can't play that ridiculous game of the hospital provider fee. We're the only state in the union that calls a bed tax a fee for a hospital. Would, are you going to support that one? No, probably not. Why not? Well, again, I think that the legislature owes our schools billions and billions of dollars, and that requires increased revenue. And if you continue to put more constraints and more weights and more inability not for the constraint. state to collect that revenue... We're just trying to say that before you tax us by calling it a fee, will you at least be honest and say that this game of calling something a fee instead of a tax is just a mechanism to get around voter approval? No, that's not how I see it because the, really? you know the constraints are. Yeah, you know you know the constraints around fees. Those are things that you pay for that you get services from. That's not the same thing as a tax, which is a general fund obligation that the state legislature then gets to decide what they do with. Fasters for transportation, hospital provider fees for insurance and health care. It all goes to these buckets of cash funds that are actually put there specifically for so services. Most of our by budget now, most of our, almost two thirds of our budget is now going into enterprises. Uh, that are not that are not out, that are outside of Enterprises the general fund. Enterprises is a creature of Tabor. Enterprises it was is. created by Tabor. All right, but but you 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 don't see this as a game. Calling it something a fee is not is, no is not a way because around. each one of those have passed constitutional muster, and that's for the course of this. I'm, I'm not asking the courts. I'm asking you, Ian. You think yeah, it's well, not a scam? I'm, I'm Let's not come a on, lawyer. be honest. No, I don't. I'm being honest. I'm telling you what I think. I'm telling you that I think that if. I expect a service. I should have to pay for it. Like, I want to drive my car on the roads of Colorado. Those roads have to get paid somehow. Those roads have to get paid, excuse me, somehow. Somebody has to pay for that. We're not paying for it adequately in income or property taxes, so I have to pay for it with a fee when I go to the DMV. Do I think that sucks? Yeah. I wish we had a fairer tax and an income tax and a property tax situation in this state that was a lot more fair so that people at the lower end of the income weren't supporting everybody else and that people at the higher end would pay their fair share. We don't have that. So instead, we have to have this a la carte government where you go in and you pay a fee for everything you need and want, and that's just the way we stitched it together here. I, I have a feeling if I got you under truth serum, you would tell me that, of course, in order to get more government for the government services and without going to the people, uh, we will call things fees. And because if I had the ability to put you under a truth serum, I get you to admit that Tabor is not actually transparent and it's just a election rigging system for low, low, low taxes. At low, low, low taxes. In, uh, Colorado, yeah. when you add together Colorado's uh, all of the taxes, state taxes and local taxes from the tax it depends mandate. where you are. Yeah, we are we are twenty second in the nation in total tax burden. We're we're as in the middle of the road as you could get. We are not an undertaxed state by any means whatsoever. I think that there is plenty of evidence. Amendment twenty three's passage and lack of funding being chief among them that we are drastically underfunding our public school system here. And look, I, I have the privilege of mentoring for an organization called Minds Matter, which works with uh, high-achieving, low-income students in Denver public schools. Oh, those schools. poor kids. They're great. No, I, I'm I know, talking well, about you uh, infecting about their minds with socialism. With well, fortunately, um, they can think for themselves, and we have plenty of debates about the right forms of government and whatnot, and I have my thoughts, and they read my columns, and sometimes they say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and they say, you're ridiculous, and they're right often. Um, but I see what happens uh, to these kids when they when they go to schools that are underfunded, when they have 30 other kids in a classroom where the teachers aren't paid enough, where they have to go work another job or 60 hours a week. I mean, if I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous. I actually think teachers should be paid at like an unbelievable amount. I think te I think schools should be cathedrals. I think teachers should make six figures. I think that they should be based upon what? Most but look at look at other countries that have done this have had an, an amazing amount of success. Singapore is like one of my favorite examples, right? Where you go there and teachers make quite a bit above average in terms of the income for the country and the education achievement about, and the, the the economic and social mobility in a country like Singapore is extremely well tied. And how about attaching well the to money to the kid instead of through the elites and the bureaucracy? So in other words, I think we can have that conversation. I well, we'll have, all right, let's have the conversation. How about taking the education funding? I look at DPS. Uh, you break it out; they spend eighteen thousand dollars a year if you broke at their whole budget. 
uh, per student. How about we take most of that and give it directly to the students and let their families choose where that oh, money should go? Oh, you're talking about vouchers, John. Yeah. Come on, man. I don't think what, that what public money should go man. to private What's... schools. I don't think public money should go to private schools, especially not religious schools. That's probably a place where we really depart that. Because, because you've decided what's right for other people. See, this is, no, this is the core difference. No, because we have a separation be, of church and state in the between, Constitution of the U.S. The core that doesn't allow us to be funding religious indoctrination. Does the GI Bill allow people to go to a private college, even if it's religious? Of course it does. It is how somebody wants to spend their money. The, the real core difference, I think, between a progressive mindset and a libertarian mindset is I, I don't want to tell people how to live. I don't want to tell people that they can't drive their car, that they can't get power from this plant, that they can't have trans fat, that they can't have a cigarette, <laughs> that they can't uh, go to this church because of uh, COVID. Uh, well, we I don't feel share comfortable, a lot more I don't feel I comfortable telling other people how to live their lives. Well, uh, I I mean, we could go down the line of LGBTQ rights. We could, do you believe in marriage equality? Yes, I do. Absolutely. That's great. Do you believe in abortion rights? Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I find that to be... I know it's a hard question, right? I find, I find it to be the most debatable of all questions. I land on the side of life, as most part, because I believe that our, um, our, our declaration def uh, defends life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you believe this Correct. fetus is a life, then your job is to protect this. If your job is to protect... Uh, if it's not a life, then it's the liberty of the family. So it's a, it's a tough question. I so think that's do you a, believe I think that, that's a reasonable position to hold? But hold on a second. Do you, do you believe, believe that people should be able to have a have a uh, uh, gun with a magazine of sixteen rounds in it? That's a hard question. <laughs> it's not a hard. It's question. a hard question. Well, it, for me, it is because do you I believe, actually, I do you believe a, that people gun rights supporter, people should be I able to believe, smoke should be able to smoke flavored vapes. Yeah, actually, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you if they want that? to, I don't think I don't think teenagers should have access to them. That's the problem, though. When you create flavored vape, what you're doing is you're creating an incentive for little kids to get hooked. Look, I was a cigarette so, smoker for so ten years, man. Oh, please. Therefore, you need to. So, should adults be able to have these choices? Adults should, yes. But what? But you know, for there, there's study after study that demonstrates this. Flavors are a gateway oh, for God. kids. They're really not there for adults. Oh God. They're not. Can I? Could, could, should people be able to buy a plastic straw with their soda? Buy one? No, yeah. should they should be given one? Be Can they be out? given one? No. It's not necessary. Unless you need one, then you should get one. How do you know what's right for other people? This is a relationship between me and the guy who's right. selling me my drink. I don't know what's right for other, yes, right you for do. other people, but I know the net effect of pajillions of straws floating in the ocean. That's so therefore the you know it's right that it should be banned. it got to be good to go to bed at night knowing how other people should live. I don't, I don't know how other people believe it or live. not. I, I I want people if they want a plastic straw that, to be given okay. one. So then I could I could run down the same sort of like straw man rabbit hole with you too if I wanted to. Uh, you you might think I believe in magazine limits. I'm actually kind of conflicted on this issue. I don't know what the right number is because it, it is be a no slippery number. slope argument. But okay, so should we have machine guns? Should we have fully automatic machine guns? There was a time we did. But should we? I think I think there we do have them. The question no, is, okay, should, but you need the an extremely is, special, should they be available at your local hunting store is my point. Maybe. I'm willing to have that conversation. Well, let's have it. All right. I, so, I, don't, all right, I, don't, so find, right I don't find them any more a, scary just because they have been illegal and well, difficult to get. it's a scary thing. It's, a, it's, an amount, it's an amount of carnage I'll tell you what, let's, for let's, a second. Let's jump, it, let's jump ahead. Should I be able should to have uh, landmines? I'll go, no, that's no, not a personal probably arm. probably not. Right. Uh, should, should I be able Bazooka. to have... Bazooka. That's a personal arm. Rocket launcher. Probably not. I'd love to have a lo Probably rocket not. launcher. I think it'd be cool. Have you ever fired one? No, have you? No. That'd be cool. Uh, People have licenses for that, though, right? Bazookas, I don't think so. You, know, but you can do the personal arms. When it comes that. down to personal arms, oh, I'm, I'm fine with it. If I want to give, if I own a business and I want to give somebody a plastic bag, I believe that that person and I have a relationship and you shouldn't come in into that relationship. I think that is. What if you gave them a plastic bag that was coated in a carcinogen, that was coated in cyanide? Is that the same? Should we be like, if, where's the line? If I if I wish to give it to him and he wishes to accept it, <laughs> fully knowing what it's laced with, yes. Well, I'm not sure he fully knows what it's laced with, and I think that's my point. Is I that think the, the point is like that the, that well, we I, I think pro I think problem, progressives I don't, don't trust people. I think progressives and I think don't trust don't trust don't understand, individuals. And I think libertarians don't understand that there are. Sh 
tons of institutions and structures and things in place that advantage certain people and disadvantage certain people. Yes, and I victims. think that there should be a referee somewhere in the middle that helps to balance the scales a little bit. I don't it, think we're all victims, but I think that there are plenty are. of actual structural inequities in the world, and it's the job of us all working together to try and And only a good government system. will be able to vanquish those inequities. Hey, how I are mean, you guys okay. going to get? How are you guys going to get your signatures for this tax increase? Well, I'm not. Thankfully, I'm not running the ballot initiative. I just get to talk about it. Which but is you're nice, part of but progress now. One of one yeah. of the most more effective uh, progressive organizations out there. I Appreciate you saying that. Oh, you yeah, are. There's no question it, about it. It's a great joy. Uh, can we actually talk? You you wanted to talk about progress now at the beginning. Can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, real fast. And we probably ought to wrap it up. This has been a fun hour. I just want to say that for sure. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you for the time. It's oh, been my a really pleasure. fun conversation. Um, so when did the independence institute start? 1985. Okay, so you're quite a bit older than we are. So we were, we were 2004, 5, 6 in that general uh, area of time. And since we've had 23 affiliate organizations pop up all over the country. So there's a lot more of us now than there were when we first got started. And, and you know, when I took over Progress Now, um, four years ago on Monday, so it's almost my four-year anniversary, which I'm really excited about, um, it was, there were only three of us there. Uh, it was, the joke is there were three white dudes with beards and two of us were named Ian. Now we actually have a staff of 14 people. We're mostly women, and we have an entire video production arm. We have an entire digital marketing uh, department, and we've just gone like unbelievably successful in this you know weird political time where people are really interested in seeing what they can do, especially to fight back against Trump and people like Cory Gardner who are out there enabling what's happening on the federal level. So it's been really, really fun uh, evil, to, to watch the organization. People. Who Trump and Cory? Yeah. I think they're evil people. I think they're really well. Trump, actually, I do think is an evil person. Let me stop there. I think Corey's just really, really wrong about stuff, and I think he knows that he's really, really wrong about stuff, which makes it even worse because then he's just enabling it while being aware that everything he's doing is awful. <laughs> everything he is doing is awful. Let that the, be the uh, quote. Everything the, he the is LW, doing is the awful. LWCF, Let's the see. Bringing is BLM cool. here is awful. Doing the workout for irrigation awful. is awful. I do think that's awful. I think the BLM thing was awful. I think that's an intentional. Uh, dismantling of the administrative state in order to give them a lot less power. Oh, so that, I know, oh, I'm sure yeah, you baby. love it, man. I'm sure you love it. Yeah, and, bring, and you can head let's on see, down so, to GJ and talk so, to those boys. So, so the idea of having, of having the BLM out where their land is is a bad idea. Away from where the actual decisions get made in Washington? Yeah, it's a terrible idea. No, where, where, you know where, where the decisions... Where their effects are felt. There were plenty That's of the field difference. Offices. Have field offices. Field offices. Have regional directors. Have more people have hired. More people hired. More people I hired. I disagree. Well, we're going to need that pretty soon, man. We're about to hit thirty percent unemployment. <laughs> so government hire them all. <laughs> you remember what FDR did? Yes. That's he, how we got he ruined our rocks, economy. Man. But we'll have that <laughs> argument at a different time. <laughs> I guess we're going to have to. Hey, John. Thanks again, man. This was really fun. I appreciate all right, it. All right. So on the one thing we 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 can't agree on, which is. If every human being owned a ukulele, there'd be no war. Agreed? That is absolutely true. Yes. Ian, are, if people want to get information, society is a free society and a polite society. Uh, yes. If every man had a ukulele and a gun, it'd be a polite you gotta, society. You always got to add the gun, man. You always got to add the gun. I believe, I believe in reasonable now. ukulele control because why would anybody <laughs> need more than one ukulele? More than four strings on a Why would you need 12 strings on a guitar <laughs> when only six will do? Well, I just, you, just because you don't, don't understand, just because I don't understand it. Plenty. People want to get information to, uh, yeah. to, to get to Progress Now. Where do they go? You can go to progressnowcolorado.org. Follow us on uh, Twitter and Facebook as well. That's where we do a lot of our work. So thanks again, John. It's been fun. Ian, we'll do it again. Thanks. Hope so. Okay. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, Click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.